I forgot I tweeted that. Okay, I'm hitting the star stream button. Hello, everybody. It's time for another Telescope Talk Hangout. It is, uh, we had to delay our last one for unfortunate reasons. If you are a an England fan for the World Cup, <laughs> that was when the last Hangout was scheduled, was last Wednesday. And, of course, uh, we had an English contingent, as you know, uh, who wanted to watch the World Cup. And uh, I didn't ask him how it went. I didn't talk to John or Adam about it. I'm, I'm, I'm being sensitive. But, uh, anyway, we are here this week. Uh, and our guest today were, is uh, Jason Major. He is a science communicator. And... Uh, uh, he is here to talk to us about something that I think is really important in this day and age of, of, of new golden age of astronomy and, and especially in amateur astronomy is using various data sets that are out there from various projects. He's 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 been very active in things like the Mars Opportunity rover images as as well as uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, the various uh, uh, Cassini probes and things like that out there that that uh, NASA has made all of this data publicly available. And so we are going to talk about what you can do as an amateur astronomer that doesn't involve any telescopes at all. It just happens to be uh, something you can do all online. And we're gonna, he's going to tell us about the tools he uses, the resources, and and we're going to take a look at some of the images that he's taken. And uh, But let me start by saying I want to thank all of the Patreon patrons who support Deep Astronomy because you guys are making this hangout possible among all the other thing other things that we do here space fan news the space videos the other hangouts as well the double as hangout so i want to thank you all for your support and we are looking at the discord server which is in the link to that is in the description box below so feel free to uh, uh interact with us on our discord server you can also of course we're using the live chat and i'm looking at that in fact all of us are uh so we'll take your comments and questions uh this is it this is your time if you want to learn about amateur astronomy and in particular this area of using online data uh, we've talked about nasa data before we've also had uh we've also talked with uh with gerald what's his last name again I'd stop. Thank you. Uh, for I, I hope I'm pronouncing. I hope I pronounced that correctly. You pronounce it better than I do, Jason. So anyway, that's the way. That's the way it was going to go. So I uh, and he dealt with Juno data. But the thing about Juno data was, and I, we'll talk about this briefly, is that it's not exactly a beginner data set. It's a very complicated one. So let me let me pull up uh, all of my people here, and now we're looking at everybody. Uh, up in the right next to me in the upper uh, right corner is uh, Jason Major. Hi, Jason. Hey yeah. Tony, how are you? Good, thanks. And down thanks below, you're welcome, and thank you for joining. Thank you for taking time out. I'm really, really big fan too. By the way, I follow him on Twitter, and his he's also got a uh, website called LightsInTheDark.com, and that's your website, right? That's your personal. That's my blog. Yes, that's your blog, and and lots of lots of cool stuff on that as well. So check it out. Uh, down below in the lower row, there are my co-hosts. Uh, down the lower left is. Uh, Adam Synergy Smith and uh, in the lower right is John Suffle. Both are from the UK. Both are helping us each time with these. Hey guys, welcome. Okay. Hey. And they and they are. Hey, everyone. Yep. And they're actively monitoring the Discord chat as well. So please uh, take it uh, and, and and please let it, you know talk to us that way. Okay, Jason. So let's start by introduction. I want to. Well, actually, I'm going to let I'm going to let um, Adam introduce you. Go ahead, Adam. Well, I think we're in for something of a treat today. We're going to take a tour around some of the worlds in our solar system, courtesy of some robotic exploration spacecraft and a talented image processor. As you say, he shares his work widely with thousands of people via social media. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Jason Major. All right, okay, Jen. Thanks very much, Adam. Um, so what I've done, and I've been doing this uh, almost 10 years now, is sharing images of planets and moons and uh, all the various worlds in our solar system on my blog as they have been released by NASA uh, and JPL and, and ESA and other, other uh, space agencies by their robotic spacecraft. Um, it, at the beginning, I was taking the images as they came in on, on press releases. But then I realized that there's a way to actually go in and grab the raw data that's coming down from the spacecraft because NASA especially makes this data publicly available. And when you do that, if you have the right 
if you have the right series of data, you can make your own very pretty, um, you know, press release quality color image. Uh, I've been learning how to do that slowly, you know, uh, uh, over the past, I don't know, eight, nine years, uh, probably about as long as I've been actually blogging uh, on Lights in the Dark. Um, but I've been learning how to do it better and better. So hopefully here I can kind of give an idea of, of how I do that and how I get some of this, this imagery put together. Um, and uh, who knows, maybe somebody else will, will pick this up and want to try it themselves. Now, when you say, when you say raw data, we, we, we need to make a, a, a distinction here because in the past, we, we, we told you about this in other uh, imaging episodes or imaging t telescope talk hangouts where we've said, look, when you take data from your own camera on your own telescope you've got to be very careful to take things called calibration images and we've talked to you about what those are dark fields and flat fields things like that you need to take those so that you can subtract those and, and divide by those to get them out of your image but you don't you don't go that far back do you jason right okay so so in photography there's there's shooting raw Okay, which is a, a, a special thing where it, you know, you, you, you get the, you get the photo data and you can adjust it. Uh, uh, what's, what's the term there? It's, it's non-destructive. So you can change it and it saves how you change it, but you can always go back and, 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 and fix it and edit it. Unlike, uh, compressed data like JPEG data. That's, that's for, uh, a photographic thing. When I say the raw data that comes in from the spacecraft, no, it's not going back that far. It's, basically just the the data as it arrives on earth and then it is changed over to image to an image file but then from there it's raw as in it hasn't been processed yet so that's that's the trick and sometimes sometimes the raw the raw files are what they call calibrated raw files they haven't been processed but they have been calibrated to a certain level of i don't know a certain standard uh, that then can then can be moved forward. So yeah, it is a little confusing when you say raw because raw means one thing in in uh, prosumer and and professional photography, and another thing entirely when you're talking about data coming in from robotic spacecraft. Right. I think in this case, raw is really really raw. It's got all of the hair all over it. It's just real dirty. Right. Lot, cosmic right. Cosmic rays. Everything else. A lot of times, a lot of times it's a mess, um, and and a mess like as far as as far as the image is concerned, it's got it's got specks in it, it's got dust. If there's imperfections in the lens, you can see it. It hasn't been made ready yet for public consumption. Is is really what it comes down to. So, I've been using Photoshop for over twenty, almost twenty five years now. So when I saw that, well, I could take this stuff and and work on it in Photoshop and make it make it as as nice as it can look i i jumped right on it um and then from there it's been a, you know very small a very small path up a very large learning curve or, or i guess a slow path up a large learning curve because i'm learning i'm learning something every time i go into things and 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 i use it for the next thing and i use it for the next thing so i'm a lot better now than i thought i was you know seven years ago that's for sure. Well, we're going to talk about uh, where you get your data from in just a minute. But the, the main tool that you use, though, is mm -hmm. is Photoshop or something like that. Like, yeah. the, like if you don't like Photoshop, there's also open source GIMP. Uh, sure. So that works, too, uh, especially if you're a Linux user. I think that's the only game in town. But the uh, right. But uh, yeah. So, OK, so that's your main tool. And let's take a look right. at some of the images that you've done. So you've sent us a lot. You've given us some some to queue up. So I've got this one here with uh, Galileo uh, and Europa. OK, uh, this is well, I was uh, all right. This is kind of a um, this is almost like a like a like an, uh, an end with this one image. But we can jump right into it and do it first. Oh, too, sorry. I, I just, I, well, I'm no, just no, doing no, it in the fine. way that they got they I, showed up on my computer. Unfortunately, I can tell you exactly how how this I did this. This is it's kind of a. It, it's kind of an interesting. Yeah, this is we're we're doing the uh, we're doing the the answer to the question here right right <laughs> off the bat, but it's fun, um, and I don't mind because I'm really I, I'm really happy with how this turned out. So now I'm assuming it's up on the screen. It's up now. I'm showing it. Okay. Yeah. So what this is is this is a color composite, and I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about what that actually means later on. But this is a color composite of data that was acquired by the Galileo spacecraft color data that was captured by the Cassini spacecraft. And I want to say that, that the Europa image itself was part of a Galileo observation set as well, but they were all taken at different times. What was, what was taken initially, that large background image showing what's obviously Jupiter's great red spot, 
that is a, that is a series of one, two, three Galileo color composites brought together and made into a, a widescreen panorama, okay? That was black and white. The color data came from Cassini's observations that were taking six months later as it passed by on its way to Saturn. The shadow of Europa was in that image, was in the central part of that image. So I put that together. Uh, I blended the one, two, three, you know, slides, cropped it so that way you don't see any any odd, you know, odd crops along the edge. So it looks like one big mosaic. And then added another color composite of Europa because that is the shadow of Europa. Now, Europa wasn't in the frame like this when Galileo took the shot. So that's me saying, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we got Europa in there as well? It's really so beautiful. That, but but I'm really happy with the result. And, um, and, and it gives a nice sense of, nice sense of depth. It's almost like, it's almost like saying, Hey, Galileo did take this shot, but you know what? Europa had just, had just slidden, uh, slid, had just slid off the, off the left side there. So, you know, we it just missed it, but there's a shadow. Well, I'm a little confused about something here though. The, the, uh, when, when when you say the the color data was in Cassini, mm -hmm. Galileo ta had images or had it on its imager. Uh, didn't it have filter wheel? Didn't it have a filter wheel as well? Usually it, to get color, all everything in astronomy is grayscale, but it's right. taken through a certain filter, like a red, green, or a blue filter, and then you can mm -hmm. assign that color table to it. That's not what happened here. The color table no, was on Cassini data. Right, because what happened here was Galileo was taking the images in one in one color wavelength of this particular scene. Ah, okay. okay, got it. So I liked I liked the shadow of Europa sitting right underneath the 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 the, the central part of the great red spot there. Um, but to put that to to use that image, I I was limited to one color filter that Galileo was using. So that part came in black and white. Now. As Cassini passed by Jupiter on its way to Saturn, it took a bunch of images that were compiled into a grand mosaic by the the uh, uh, the, 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 the science imaging team uh, in Boulder that 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 did all of the Cassini work. So they they assembled this this gorgeous image of what's basically half of Jupiter illuminated by the sun, and this scene was in it minus the moon and the moon shadow. So I was able to take that color and overlay it here in the same spot as everything else was, basically coloring it as it should have been colored had, had Galileo been able to take a color snapshot. This is really extraordinarily nice. So the, uh, do, you, do you happen to recall how many images from each spacecraft you, you used? What, what well, since, since the, back, the entirety of the background is, that, that's made up of three frames. Okay, so, so three, three of those merged them together, uh, you know, blurred the edges so that way they overlaid nicely. So there's three. And then there's the overlay of the, uh, of the calibrated color Cassini image. So there's four. And then the moon itself is a composite of three separate images. So there's five, six, seven. So seven entire images went to make this one, which is actually pretty good. Uh, it's actually a, a low, you know, a low number because sometimes if <laughs> I was I'm gonna making, say, yeah, I, I've, I've done them before, which are, you know, 12, 24, 36 images all go together. It depends on what color data is available. Yeah. And there can also be hundreds depending on the, the particular. Oh, yeah. Image, the, uh, and I, and I do a lot of this stuff. I mean, I do all this manually. So I'm working on, I'm working on color layers, color channels, and I'm aligning everything basically by eye. I don't write any scripts other than other than having some uh, maybe some color adjustment presets that I'll save in Photoshop. I'm not running a script or I'm not doing any stacking. These are just as they come, I'll adjust the contrast, I'll adjust the sharpness and 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 levels and things like that to bring out as much detail. But they're really kind of just like, you know, I'm 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 putting a puzzle together. So this is really painstaking. Now you, you kind of have yeah. to do it by hand though, because you said you're not, we said before we started, you're not using fits images and we've talked about fits images right. before. We won't go into it here, but that's the, that's the scientific data format that these images are generally processed in. You don't right. use that, right? You're using something like, what are you using? JPEGs or PNGs or, or I'm, TIFFs or what? I'm using, I'm using now. And when I made this image, I'm using the raw files that came in, which are, 
I guess they would be PNG. They might be PNGs. They might be, um, they might be TIFFs. Uh, but what happens is, is when I download the images and I use the, um, I use the Opus node, uh, which is, which is a, an online portal that's set up by SETI, uh, to access the, the planetary data system that NASA and JPL manage. Uh, cause the Opus node is, is, is a nice user interface, whereas PDF can, um, PDS can be a little wonky. Um, so I download the raw images there. And I and I open them in Photoshop and I work with them there. And a lot of times I'm I'm opening them. I even have to change the uh, the, the the name of the file extension that comes in that I that I initially download. I have to change it from say txt to raw, so that way Photoshop can recognize that it's a raw file and go, hey, how do you want me to open this? And I I put in the parameters and it gives me an image I can work with. Okay. All right. Now if. One of the good things about using Fitz images, if you ever did use them, was they have within them this world WCS coordinates, world coordinate system that lets you align and it'll rotate. But that that is uh, not a beginner activity either. Uh, well, well do, should we talk about Opus now, or do you want to show some more images? What should we do? Um, I can. Well, I, since we're going to go into where I'm getting the, the the data from to make all of these images, or to make most of these images, I can show you what the what the Opus uh, actually okay. looks like. I've got Opus. I've got the image you sent called Opus One. One okay. uh, up now. Let me clear that out. It's not. The, you may need to. We, we should probably put in a URL somewhere. But can, can you just say what the uh, URL is briefly? Let me see how how the the URL is. I don't know how this so, is. There's a lot of text on it, and I don't know how it's going to come through on this. Yeah, page. I mean, okay. So so the main the main site is under. Um, let's see. It's tools dot pds hyphen rings dot seti dot org. And that's the that's the main site there. I'm I'm sure if you I'm sure if you did a Google search for Opus PDS, it would bring you to the exactly the same place. Okay. But what it is is it's it's a it's an alternate search engine basically for data that is on NASA's PDS system. And PDS stands for Planetary Data System. And everything gets archived there. So at a certain amount of time after the images have been, have been initially downlinked, it might be six months, it might be a year, that, that data goes into the PDS. Opus is specially formatted to, to look at the, uh, and, and it's, it's why it's called the rings. It's specially formatted to look at the outer planet stuff. So you're not going to find things there from Mars or from Mercury or Earth um, unless they were taken by spacecraft that were out at Jupiter or Saturn or, you know, Neptune. So the neat thing about Opus is it allows you to get the raw data files, the uncompressed images in that were taken by Voyager, that were taken by, you know, Voyager 1 and 2, Galileo, New Horizons, and Cassini. Um, and by getting that uncompressed data, initially when, when, say, for example, Cassini would do a flyby of Titan, and we're going back because Cassini, you know, isn't, isn't around anymore, uh, uh, you know, since September of last year. But, you know, say it's, say it's July of 2015, Cassini just did a flyby of Titan. Within a few days, maybe even that same day, though that image data would have come down and been on the Cassini mission site. That, those images that were there from that flyby were compressed JPEGs. And it took me a while to figure that out. I'm like, why is, why is this stuff, why do I see such beautiful imagery, you know, from earlier uh, uh, imaging sets, but what I have is, is all kind of crunchy. And it turned out that it's because that, that the images that came out initially were compressed JPEGs. What you can get to on uh, Opus and on PDS is the uncompressed files. So what's your, so if you have the Opus one image up, yep. this is an example search that's that's built for cassini imaging so for you, you, the tricky thing with cassini is you have to tell it when you want it to look so the the observation time is a key thing for the for the uh, cassini searches so here you could see the, you know the minimum i would have had 2013 and it would have been day number 190 and cassini works in such a way that it numbers the days from one, which is January one, all the way to uh, 365, which is December 31 uh, of whatever year. They don't all do that, but Cassini does. So I, I have another. I have another uh, tool that I use that tells me what number the days are in a particular year. So I can I can specifically look for certain targeted observation times. So anyway, that's there. You tell it when you want it to look, what what time span you want it to look. You click the image, which would be the instrument name. And Cassini has three instruments. 
ISS is its visible light Im imagery. So that's what you want to look if you're looking for uh, uh, images to make what I do, which is a color image. Um, you, you, you tell it what the target is, which is Saturn. And you can even, down at the bottom, you can see where you can even narrow down, okay, Saturn. But do you want to find images from Enceladus? Do you want to find images of Saturn's rings or Titan or Methany or Deony or whatever moon you might want to look for? So you can narrow it down. And after you've clicked all those things, you would go up and you'd see that browse results number change. And the more you drilled down, the, the smaller that number would get. And you'd click that browse results. And then it, if you pop up the uh, uh, image Opus 2. Okay. Okay. So then, for example, you would start seeing th this screen would come up, which would be the result of your data search. The key here is these are all monochrome images when you finally do get a hold of them. But this particular tool, which is why I love Opus, tells you visually whether you're looking at infrared, whether you're looking at visible red, visible green, visible blue, or some other uh, uh, you know, clear channel image that's not specific to a wavelength, the color wavelength. It lets you know if you have the data you need to make a calibrated color image. So that, that's what I love about this. You can see some of them are purple. Some of them are kind of like a pale pinkish. That pale pinkish is visible red wavelength. The green is green. Um, and then over towards the right there, those are blue. That would be the visible blue. So once you get, once you find an image that you might want to work on, you can, you can click, a, there's a little, a little uh, icon that pops up. It looks like an information eye. You would click that and it would bring you to Opus 3. Okay. It's it would bring you to a detailed version of, of this said image with the preview JPEG that you would have maybe originally gotten from that observation set had you looked uh, on the Cassini mission site when it was originally taken. But you can see that, that uh, on the left there where it says PDS products, it has raw image, it has calibrated, and it has preview image. What I download is what I have underlined there, which is the calibrated IMG file. I'll right click on that and I'll download that file. And I'll and this, for example, would be the red version. So I'll download the red, go back to the first part, find the green of the same of the same thing, download the green, and I'll download the blue. And then I'll change the uh, the the file names on those that I've just downloaded in on my computer. I'll change the, the uh, I'll change them from txt dot txt to dot raw. And by doing that, it forces Photoshop to be able to open them. I don't understand and there's a, why they've got txt suffixes. That's weird. Um, you know what? I don't know either. <laughs> That's so strange. I really don't. Well, they well, okay. So the so the FMT. I think the FMT is that a, is that actually a um a, a fit data file? Mm -hmm. I know I have seen other. I have seen uh like Voyager comes in it. There's act they do have FIT files. Yeah, um, I'm not sure what FMT is honestly. I don't either. F fits are either FTS or FITS. So okay. Or, or so FIT. um, because I use Photoshop. I'm going right for the image file, but no, it doesn't download as a .img. It downloads as a, a .txt. So I change that extension, and then I drag it into Photoshop, and I download them in the order of red, green, and blue because that helps me know what I'm looking at because the file name is this big you know, alphabet file name. It doesn't come in like a nice, easy thing like that. So I'll, I'll open them. I'll download them in RGB order. I'll open them in RGB order so that way I can change the name of the layer in Photoshop to red, green, or blue. So I know what I'm working on when it comes time to compile. Okay. Uh, now, now this is uh, how you're getting the data. I'm going back to Opus one for a minute. You need to know this is this, even this doesn't strike me as something that you can just casually do. You kind of need to know what you're doing to use. There's a, yeah. You, you know, know quite a few things. Oh, Opus is on a level of on a level of, of difficulty levels. Um, I would I would put PDS at like you know a seven or eight in in difficulty, and Opus brings that down to you know a five or six. Okay. So because it's, the, the nice thing about it is the the um, these big windows that say observation time, instrument name, planet, you can X those out uh, in in the in the upper right right hand part of their windows. If you don't want to use those and, 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 you know, drop in another, another parameter, 
Um, and other instruments use different types of parameters. Uh, uh, Voyager might use a different type of, of parameter. Um, but you do kind of need to know what you're looking for. So it's a little tough. You know, if you're just coming in, just just coming in the door on this, how do I make a color image from um, from you know raw files from spacecraft? This is a little tricky. This is a way of getting this is a way of getting the best image data for that job. The easy way of doing it would be to go onto the Cassini mission site and actually find uh, uh, under under the multimedia available actually uh, finding the, the what's the word. The compressed JPEGs, the preview JPEGs, and right-clicking those and, and dropping them out into your computer. But you're not going to get the quality. This yeah. is the this is the only way to get a hold of that uncompressed stuff. That's cheating, anyway. That's not what we're here for. We're here to do it ourselves. <laughs> well, you so. know, it, uh, that's what I was doing for a long time. Um, I, I I was using that compressed data and and making you know making things that I thought were pretty pretty darn good looking, but. Once I got a hold of the the raw stuff, I said, "Wow, you know this is this is the the nuances of colors and the the the, the fine sharp lines and you know especially when Saturn Cassini's cameras are beautiful." Um, what I got out of using uncompressed files was you know uh, a leap ahead from what I was doing with the uh, with the JPEGs. Okay, now most of us know that JPEG is a comp a lossy compression format. It's designed to make relatively uh, nice photos large ones into small file sizes uh the the image files that you're downloading the ones that come down as .txt that you are then renaming as raw those uh are are, are they presumably not compressed those are not compressed so they're, so, so they're large then they could be conceivably large files they're a decent size as far as file is concerned but the resolution of the images is still 1024 by 1024 because that's what cassini for example especially that's what cassini was shooting in that's okay the camera size right that's, a that's the camera size. size so so even though when you open those raw files in photoshop um you need to open them in a they actually come in in a 32-bit format so you're limited as far as what you can do in Photoshop, which is why you have to actually uh, drop that down to 16 to even start to do a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, editing that you're going to have to do, like cleaning things up and you know using any type of any type of pixel editing tools. And then at the end, I, I even save it down further. I drop it down to 8 bit. Um, so you're starting off with a, with a decent size file, but it's still only 1024 by 1024. That's just that's just what Cassini took. Okay, so bit depth. Let's talk a little bit about that for a second. Bit depth, when you see something that's an 8, 16, 32, 64-bit image, that means that each pixel in that image has a value in the range of, if it's an 8-bit image, but 2 to the 8. Uh, if it's a 16-bit bit image, it's between 2 to the 16. So what you know, the, 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 the different, which the larger the numbers, the more you can imagine the more size that each pixel would take up what makes it even worse is fits images can also have float values and they can have double float values and so you get things that are eight bit eight bytes each image is eight bytes long and then or 16 bytes long uh and so it can be they can get quite large very fast but that's what the bit depth is but the higher the bit depth the more information you've got, the more color gradients you've got. So a, an 8-bit image is not going to have as many defined colors in each pixel as a 16 or a 32-bit image is. But Jason just said, and I, I think I agree, This is you immediately go ahead and, and truncate that down a little bit. You compress it down. Well, if it, it right. did have 16 or 32, you go down to 8. And you find right. that, and I and that I do that at good. the very end because I like working. I like working oh, with, okay. with, the, with the sixteen because you can do pretty much anything in Photoshop on a sixteen bit image that you can do on an eight bit image. But thirty two bit is limited. Um, you know, you try if you try to go and erase if there's noise in that image and you try to erase it or you try to apply a filter to uh, reduce noise, it's not going to let you do it. You need to you at that point you need to drop down to sixteen bit under file mode, and and then you can start doing things. So for visual images where things are designed to look pretty, you you reach a point of diminishing returns with higher bit depth. With where in a fits image where each pixel actually has a scientific unit attached to it, you want as many decimal places as you can. So with 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 visual image processing, you don't need quite as much information as you do if you're trying to do science on the data. Right. Uh, right. You know, and a lot, and that's the thing too. A lot of this, well, what, well, not a lot of it, all of it, all of the stuff that I work on, I'm aiming for uh, aesthetic 
purposes. I'm aiming, sure. aiming for a visual representation of of what the spacecraft saw. In addition to if you know bringing out detail, you know, um, I like to I like to find a, f- find that happy medium between this is what this is what it would look like if you were if you were hanging on for for dear life on Cassini in your spacesuit and you looked where it was looking um, and to bring out the detail in, in that view. So that way you can see as much as you can see. Yeah. That's uh that's, that's a great way to describe it. That's really cool. Okay. We're about halfway through our hangout. So let me take a quick break and remind you guys that you are watching a telescope talk hangout. Uh, my name is Tony Darnell. I didn't even introduce myself from deep space. And uh, with me are uh, Adam synergy Smith and John Suffolk as well. And we're talking with our guest, uh, Jason major about image processing from data from other spacecraft so uh guys uh did we is there anything on you have any questions that we should maybe bring up now any comments you want to read out loud or should we just keep going don't forget you muted i want to see more pictures of our solar system please oh okay but i I, we will get to that but i just want to make sure we have is there any good questions you want to read out Um, not yet okay well if you do feel free to interject and we will Read your comments and questions as we go along. All right, so let's show. What should I put up, Jason? Adam wants to see more pictures. Okay, so let's see what we've. Um, oh, and by the way, if anybody wants to go and 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 take a look at these on their own, uh, I, my most recent stuff, which is using the high res raw data, um, is on my Flickr album, uh, and you can find me on Flickr, flickrcom slash lights in the dark, all one word, Good. and I have an album there called the Solar System. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff as, you know, as I work on them, I keep putting them in there. So any, and most of these will be in there. Um, but, you know, check that out if you want to see some of these on your own. And you can download them and do what you want. Because you know what? This is all publicly available data. Um, and so I'm not, I, I'm not claiming proprietary ownership of any of this type of stuff. You know, you want to take it and print a poster. You want to put on a T-shirt, put on a T-shirt. You know, have a good time with it because this is, this is our data. This is our solar system. Yeah, that's um, cool. So, okay, so why don't we, uh, how about that Saturn hexagon picture? I, I like that one. All right, let me go find it. Here we go. Saturn hexagon. It is up. Okay, I have okay. it up. Okay, so this is, this is a, a, a fantastic feature. At the top of Saturn, I said at the top of Saturn, Saturn's North Pole, there is a jet stream feature that is in this amazing geometric shape of a hexagon. And it's the whole thing is so big that you could fit easily two, if not three Earths inside of it. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's incredible. Um, it's kind of like the idea of, you know, Jupiter's uh, a great red spot. So it's, it's, it's that type of size. Well, maybe like the GRS was, you know, maybe 30 years ago. But it's, it's, it's this amazing high-speed jet stream that forms the system. And then right in the middle of it is this, like hurricane type vortex that plunges down into the atmosphere of Saturn's North pole. And you can see that here. And this is, so this is a composite, a color composite made from three images and they were three uncompressed raw images The the data was calibrated. So it came in calibrated so that when I, when I put it together, I took the red file, the green file, the uh, blue file, and I, assembled them, aligned them, and assembled them in Photoshop in the channels. And the result is fairly close here. Now, what I do is I boost the contrast up and, you know, I try to keep the color about the same, but I'll boost the contrast and the sharpness so you can see as much detail as possible. Um, but this is, the, this is the color. This is the, because it's a calibrated raw file, it's, it's made to pretty much what, what, I, what we would call natural color. This is what the average human eye would see if it were, you know, flying along again with Cassini uh, as it passed over Saturn's north or passed by Saturn's north pole, looking down at the uh, polar region there. And that that vortex in the middle, that dark aqua blue color, that's that's the color that it looks like. I mean, it's 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 really it's really incredible. And that color has changed as the seasons on Saturn have progressed towards a um, towards a, a northern summer. So uh, it's it's really really amazing, and and Cassini being around Saturn since two thousand four to two thousand seventeen, it's been able to watch these changes happen as the illumination starts to light up uh, Saturn's north pole. Um, so it's really really cool. 
Uh, and then all those little bright spots, those are just all little other types of storm systems, these little eddies that, uh, that bring up clouds and form clouds. A lot of the clouds are made out of uh, uh, Saturn. Saturn's mostly um, helium, hydrogen with some ammonia and methane. So a lot of those bright areas are, um, are ammonia ices. Uh, really, really super cool. And because, as you talked about before, with uh, oh, did you want to ask something, Adam? I, I was just going to mention that I hear that NASA's... Uh, been uh, nominated for an Emmy for the Cassini mission uh, grand finale. Coverage. Yeah, they are. They are indeed the uh, the imaging team over at uh, over at NASA and 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 JPL. Um, they uh, they put together this this beautiful film. I mean, well, it was a video uh, uh, about the end of Cassini. And I, and I can tell you, when I first saw it, now I've been following Cassini since. Oh, probably about 2007, 2008. And I've been featuring images since I started blogging in uh, February of 2009. So when the end of the mission was approaching, I mean, it was really sad to know that, that we weren't going to have the spacecraft any longer. Um, so when I saw that, when I saw the film that they put together, the, you know, the three minute, the three minute movie, I, I had tears coming down my face. You know, it was really, really emotional was uh, to, to think about the end of Cassini. So, you know, that uh, apparently the, that they were recognized by the Academy or the enemy, uh, the Emmys or whoever votes on that type of stuff as well. So, uh, yeah, yeah, they were, have been nominated. Maybe they'll win. I, I really hope they do. Well, you know, the, they're going to do the same thing with Juno. I don't know about a grand finale, but they are at least going to, uh, do the same thing with Juno that they did with uh, Cassini at the end of its mission. Although right. Right. But, but Juno, Ju well, like Cassini, Juno has been granted some extra time. Yep. So I'm not sure of, you know, when that's going to be, um, well, it's the been, with, they've got no, funding in through uh, 2022, so they got 2022. Okay, yeah. so the, the the thing with Juno is the environment that it's in is so much harsher than what Cassini was in. It's possible, and again, I hope this doesn't happen, but it's possible that uh, you know Juno will will end up turning off. You know, or, or we'll lose communication with it just because of the radiation environment that it's been going through. Right. So, you know, I think a lot of it after after the initial the initial plan, the initial mission mission plan, I think a lot of it might just be luck that you know Juno keeps going. Well, because it's in that higher orbit, they it's got more time. Uh, right. But had they exactly. gone to their originally planned orbit, then they wouldn't have lasted. I think past February of this year. Right. That was going to be an eleven day orbit, which would have been which would have kept it really close and deep inside Jupiter's radiation field, yeah. um, which would have event. I mean, it's, it's got, you know, several inches of, 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 uh, of metal, you know, of lead protecting its, its, its sensitive guts in there. Uh, but even that would have, would have eventually <laughs> roasted it on an 11 day orbit. Yeah. So who knows what's going to happen at the end of Juno, but we might be able to go through something like this again, but you're right about NASA. NASA has this down. They were really, I think, capitalized on the emotional appeal of all of this and really got the public interested in what Cassini had done. So I think sure. uh, hats off to NASA. Uh, so I want to go back to this. Um, I want to go back to this uh, uh, hexagon for a second. You going back to what we know about Opus, you had to go to Opus, know the time of this flyover over the pole. Mm -hmm. And then you selected the, because then we got all these thumbnails. I have this uh, thing called Opus two up now uh, that kind of shows all the thumbnails that you get as a result of a search. You then went through those thumbnails, clicked on them, or down, and then you came up with what's called Opus Three. Opus Three is the is the detail of that image. You downloaded that in image format for every single image that you wanted to play with. Do you happen mm -hmm. to recall how many that was for the hexagon? Well, in, th in this this particular view is a that's a, that's a single frame view. So you know, other than maybe some slight cropping. That's the that's the view inside Cassini. I know, but sometimes uh, they take multiple images that you can you can stack to get better better. I don't signal. stack for this type of stuff. I, I use okay. I use the three I use the three RGB images that I get a hold of, and uh, and and I didn't I really didn't need to. Oh, the okay. the quality of the quality of the raws that came in was so good that I, I didn't I didn't need to go hunting for more data. Um, I was really happy with the result on this. Good. So this is something that a, a person who's maybe not played with Cassini data before could actually maybe right. get their hands on. And data. as far as the time goes, like a lot of times I'll, I'll search within a span of days. So I don't need to know that, that this observation was taken at, you know, uh, whatever UTC particular time it was. I could have, I could have told uh, Opus, show me what Cassini has, has captured with its ISS instrument uh, on this day to this day. 
and then look at the result. Okay. And, you know, if the, if, if those results were a thousand or if those results were, you know, 200 results, it's not much to scroll down through and see, and see what, what's available. Great. Okay. Uh, so try it yourselves, folks. You could do this by going to Opus to see another image. Uh, okay. So maybe bring up the, um, bring up the Neptune image. Okay. Hang on. Let me find it. So. Wait a minute. I don't have a Neptune image. Is there no, uh, this, Nep Nept yeah. Neptune V2? I got a Voyager 2 image of Neptune in there. Okay. I've got, uh, I've got, oh, did I? Did I not get it? Well, I can I can try and get it real quick. There's a I mean, there's a Pluto image in there. Um, there's a couple of from uh, there's a couple of Jupiter. Um, oh yeah, I totally passed by the uh, Neptune image. Hang on, hang on, hang on, folks. Okay, there it is. It's uh, now. It is now up. I have the Neptune image up now. Okay, so this is this is an image that was. Obviously, it's Neptune, and it was captured by Voyager Two uh, in August of uh, nineteen. What I, what I have put the date on there? Um, uh, yeah, August twenty fourth, nineteen eighty nine. So with Opus, you're you're able to kind of like go back in time and revisit some of these, you know, like the the Voyager Grand Tour. Uh, you know, check out all of the images that that it captured of. Uh, Jupiter, of of Neptune, of Uranus. There's another. There's a Uranus image in here, and in a lot of ways, you know, it, it's the same thing. You're finding the you're finding the the three color filters that you need. Now, the tricky thing with with Voyager is it was taking images in not red but orange, so and and not blue but violet. I think it did take some blue as well, but it took some violet. So, so, so sometimes you have to let the orange stand in for red and let the violet stand in for the blue and then work backwards from there. So a lot, so then what I'll do is I'll, I'll compile an image. I'll get the, I'll clean it up as much as I, as much as I, I, I want to, um, you know, remove specs. A lot of times these images will come in with, with bright pixels and that's either uh, that's either the, the result of the radiation environment of the planet itself sparking the, 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 uh, the, the camera CCD to fire and, and, and create noise, or it could even be from cosmic rays coming in from outside our solar system or charged particles from the sun. If the longer the exposure for that particular frame, the more chance that there's going to be noise in it. And it's just like, it's just like taking, you know, taking, uh, uh, uh pictures with your own camera and your own settings, manual settings, it's dark out there around Neptune. It's dark out around Pluto and even, and even Saturn. So a lot of times these images that look so bright and colorful, if you were there yourself, it, they look a lot darker just because, you know, the, the amount of solar illumination is so low. So as a result, the cameras had to be very sensitive and at the same time, sometimes they had to have um, uh, longer exposures, which allows more cosmic radiation to come in and and create noise so once i've cleaned all that up um and i get what i and i get the the crop and the angle that i like um i will you know i'll i'll look to see what the real color should be and sometimes i'll do an internet search and just be like listen w what's my what's my true color of neptune what you know what am i shooting for just so i know that I, I'm kind of close. So, you know, there is a little bit of fudging, you know, and eyeballing when it comes down to some of these things. And, and I've been, I've been hit or missing it for, you know, for years now. So I've, I've kind of, I finally gotten to the point where I'm, I'm, I'm happy at knowing where to look for the right information to get the result that I want, that I could say, yeah, this is, this is true-ish. This is natural-ish. This is, you know, you may, it might be off by, by, but you know what? Everybody's monitor is off. You know, color is always weird like that. So, when people will say, Hey, is this, is this real color? Be like, it's pretty darn close. Yeah. That's a good point. People don't forget that people get the, you, one needs to adjust their, their monitors to get the same effect on monitors across the, uh, the country because each monitor is a little bit different. And, and oh yeah. Very much. I mean, you know, you look at, if you look at one of these images on my, on my, my MacBook, or, you know, you look at it on your iPhone or you look at it on your Android, you're going to see something every, they're all going to show something slightly different. So, you know, the person that's looking at it on, on their, their galaxy, is going to go, hey, is this true color? 
and I'm looking at it on my MacBook and I say, it, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty close. We're still looking at two different things. Yeah. Your guys are depending on the gamma setting I have on my laptop to see what color this is. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's what you're seeing. Okay. But yeah, so that's, so that, well, that's, what's nice about Opus as well. All of the missions that went out to the outer planets, that stuff's all in there. So, so Voyager, Voyager one, uh, you can get that data. Um, you know, uh, uh, Voyager 2, you can get that data. You can get New Horizons. There's a Pluto image in there from uh, New Horizons flyby uh, on, on, on July 14th of 2015, which just passed. That was a milestone. Um, so that was, a, that was an awesome day in space history. Should, should I put that uh, up? Yeah, put it up. Now, the, the, this is what I call – now, I, I labeled this one Pluto True Color because yeah. the, the, the data that I downloaded was in an extended color. So that was that was a little farther on either gamut of of our, our our eyes visual range. Great for science because it shows all the, the the subtle detail of the various types of terrain and material that's on the surface of Pluto. But it's not what we would see if we were hanging on for dear life aboard New Horizons. We would see something that's a lot a lot more like this this kind of brownish, reddish, rusty colored you know uh, uh, almost like a dolce de leche. Uh, color world, which itself is is beautiful. So there's no, I mean, I don't, I don't say one is one is more valuable than the other. They both have different different values. Yeah, different by extended groups. color, we should mention that you know the near it goes past red into the near infrared, which your eye can't see, up through right. the blue end, violet to the the uh, ultraviolet. It goes it goes into UV, yeah. and and again, that's and some of the uh, images of Pluto you will see if you do a Google search for New Horizons Pluto, whatever. Um, you you'll see a mix of these and the good news sources will say well this is this is natural color this is true color versus this is extended color um usually the the uh, the captions if they use the correct captions will note that but extended color is not they used to call they used to say false color and we we the imaging the imaging societies are moving away from that just because yeah it it is false color, but it sounds like you're lying to people when you say that. So it, it does kind of turn your your uh, your average viewer off. So extended color is um, is is a much better term to use. Yeah. I found. Yeah. Now that's another thing that's a little deceiving about these Pluto images in particular. You said it's dark out there, and and you're dark, right. yeah. This is scaled way up. I mean, this was. Uh, sure. It looks like it's really bright out yeah. there, but you got to think about you know the sun has traveled very very, or the light from the sun has traveled very far to get out there, and it's pretty dim out here. So the cameras are pretty sensitive. Yeah, uh, very sensitive. And uh, um, you know, at one point before Pluto, uh, before New Horizons uh, arrived at Pluto, there was a there was an online campaign, a hashtag campaign to uh, to show what the lighting environment is like at Pluto and they called it Pluto time hashtag Pluto time and you would go you go online and you would you would enter your you would enter your latitude and uh, or basically tell it where you know what city you're in and it would tell you when the clear light the clear day illumination outside matched what it looks like noon on Pluto so for me here in Rhode Island you know, it was like, okay. And it, you know, whatever, whatever time of year it was, it was like, Hey, go outside just after sunset. And, um, it might've been like, it might've been about 15, 20 minutes after local sunset. This is what it looks like on Pluto at noon. The surprising thing was it was brighter than I thought because, you know, being three, you know, being 3 billion miles away from the sun, you think, Oh, it must be like, it must be like, you know, a starry night sky, uh, uh, but no, it's a lot brighter than than it, than I, I I thought. But still, it was you know it's dark. It's a it's a dark place. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're running out of time. I just want to get to uh, a couple comments here. Uh, uh, but it was um, Galaxy is commenting on Neptune. Many missed opportunities for the pursuit of truth in that system. You know that's true. We haven't really looked at Neptune all that much. Uh, all, all of the icy world, Neptune, Uranus, um, you know, they, they, they haven't really gotten a lot of love uh, over the years. And that's just because of, you know, the, the Grand Tour mission was was a really lucky time. Right. And was, there was an alignment of all the planets. Sure. So. Sure. And there's a um, there's a uh, there's a film out uh, that just got released earlier this year. Was it The Farthest? I think it was called. And um, and, it, and it discussed how that all set up. I mean, we're lucky we really are lucky that we have the images that we do mm -hmm. of 
of the Neptune and, and, and Uranus systems um, from from vo the Voyagers because you know you can't just you can't just shoot a shoot a spacecraft out there. Uh, you need to use all of those slingshots and gravity assists and everything. So yeah, it was it was it was, a, it was serendipitous that that we uh, we were able to even do that. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, okay. Well, let's see. Oh, just keep looking up and be careful not to stumble over your telescope. <laughs> I'm gonna have. I'm gonna steal that Galaxia, just so you know. That's gonna be my new tagline. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other pictures we should show, or, or or do? What about Discord, guys? Do you guys see anything down there? Nothing. Uh, nothing on Discord. Okay. All right. Just want to check in. Uh, well, oh. There's one thing, Tony. What? Go ahead. Um, going back to that um, hex hexagon on um, um, is it, uh, Jupiter, or Saturn, on Saturn rather, um, some people have um, said that it's irrefutable proof of the existence of aliens. How oh, you can call them conspiracy theorists if you wish, I like to call them dipshits. <laughs> <laughs> but they saw this, this hexagon. It couldn't be made um, naturally. It's got to be aliens. Yes, of course. Well, you mean because of the straight lines and the corners yeah, and stuff the, like the that? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and they also believe that inside it there's a, a pyramid. I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the, the other than I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole on that type of stuff, but the um, the hex hexagonal shape is actually a uh, it is a very natural formation of fluid dynamics, especially considering the size of 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 Saturn, how quickly its wind speeds move, and uh, they've they've reproduced they've reproduced this effect in the laboratory using colored dyes and a spinning vat of of liquid, and and the hexagonal shape forms. It's 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 the strangest thing. Someone who's you know into into physics and and fluid dynamics could could probably talk all day about it. But but this is a shape that that is created naturally. It's it's um it's really strange. But it's what happens when you have you know all of this wind and all of this 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 air and it's not you know breathable air, but all of this air and atmosphere on a planet that has no solid surface to stop it. The only thing it's 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 basically just you know it's not it's not a ball of liquid. It's a ball of fluid, and that fluid is atmosphere. Well, we're starting to run out of time, but I, we, and we haven't talked about Mars stuff yet. So um, you've got some Mars pictures for us too, Jason. Uh, where do you get those? You said you can't get them from Opus. Opus is for the outer planets, right? And well, what's nice then is the Mars image, and I'll try to sh I'll try to do this quick. The Mars image is uh, the sources are really easy as a, as as opposed to Opus. So if you um, like, for example, I've got a few images here from on on the Curiosity site. Okay, for the uh, Mars Science Laboratory, you can just go on there. Uh, and it's run by JPL. You want to go on the JPL site, not the uh, not the NASA not the NASA branded site. You want to go on the JPL one, um, and you can find raw confusing. images. What's that? It, which is always confusing the way they have. Yeah, yeah. Set JPL up. runs runs a much better site than than the NASA branded one. Mm -hmm. um, so you can find the latest raw images in from Curiosity uh, on on just by going through the little menus that they have there on the screen, uh, and you can and they they on JPL they, site. On the JPL site, okay. they do it by soul, which is the Mars word for day. Um, and you can find the latest images in on all the various cameras that Curiosity has. And some of them are already in color. So that's nice. You can see color images, uh, uh, the latest things, the latest views in from Gale Crater on Mars just by going to the Curiosity mission site. Um, as far as the earlier rovers, the, uh, the MER, Mars Exploration Rovers, which of those two, only Opportunity is running right now. They don't, you can do basically the same thing, um, but they don't come in in color. You, if you want to see the color versions of these, you have to make them yourself. And so I, I had put up there the MER1 image. Yeah, I've got it up now. Okay, so this is basically, if you go on to the uh, MER site, you can find the Opportunity latest raw images. This is a page that will come up, and I often use what what says the science camera, the panoramic camera, um, and it lists it by soul again. So you know, it, right now it's in its five thousand something soul. The last one we've gotten in from from Opportunity was on uh, soul five one one one. That was about a month ago, and the reason being is because it's a global dust storm on Mars that put the rover into rover into a, a, a sleep 
um, a sleep phase. So we're waiting for the skies to clear on Mars and opportunity to wake up. But basically, it shows you how many of those images you have. When you click on, for example, uh, one of the souls and you say view selected soul, you'll click that button and it will bring you to a page like this one here, which is MER2, okay. if you want to pop that up. It's up. This would be uh, panoramic camera results from Soul 5101. And um, you see how some of them, and they're really easy to tell when they're, when they're all aligned like that. They look like four of the same image. What those actually are is, and I'm going to say this from left to right, for example, on that top row, that will be the red channel image uh, on the left camera. Then it's the red channel image on the right camera, then the green channel image of the left camera, and the blue channel image of the left camera. That's just how how opportunity takes a lot of these pictures. They want to get a left and right for stereo viewing, and then they do a left, red, green, and blue for color for color assembly. So uh, what I'll do is I'll click on that first one and I'll copy that image that pops up, that large version that pops up. I'll put it in Photoshop under the red channel. I'll actually open my channels palette and paste it under red. I'll come back to this and I'll skip that second one because I don't want the, I don't want the right. I want the same, the same view from the camera on the left in green. I'll copy and paste it in the green channel and then I'll come back and grab the blue one, paste it into the blue channel and that gives me a color image I can start to work from. If that, if you and, they're all, on, and, they're, and they're all more or less registered by this time. I mean, well, you... okay. So, so what's nice about, as opposed to, as opposed to Cassini and Voyager and Galileo and all of these other moving spacecraft, when opportunity or curiosity takes an image, it stops and it, it just, you know, it'll, it'll take a shot and then take another shot and take another shot. So it's not moving around and what it's looking at isn't moving around while it's taking. The only thing that might change is the shadows because the sun is moving. Oh, I should say Mars is rotating. So the shadows might have a little bit of a color fringe effect. And I usually clear that up in Photoshop without, you know, without much, much ado. Um, so it's nice because you can just drop those images in there and you don't have to worry too much about alignment. The only time you have to worry about alignment is if you're trying to take take this frame view and move it and stick another one on the side to get more of a panorama. That's when you start having to, having to figure out how do I align these things? How do I overlay them and, and, you know, reduce the amount of stitching in between them that, so it's not obvious. Um, but if you were, uh, you jump back to where I have the, uh, I'll bring up this one cause this one's actually really cool. The opportunity heat shield. Uh, you see that image of the thing? Do, 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 do. Yep, here it is. Okay, so you pop that up. This was taken uh, shortly after Opportunity landed. Uh, I, I want to say it was probably taken back in March or April of uh, 2004. The rover went to go see where the heat shield landed after after its its landing and the airbags deployed and it, it left the it left this little platform and everything. So you could see way way up at the top in the distance there on the right. There's the tracks from the rover's wheels and what it had done is, and it kind of crosses over and goes diagonal across the uh, top of the image here. But this is a two, this is a color version, two view stitch together. Now the two views were taken at different times of the day. So the lighting is a little different on the left half than the right half. But what I would have done is downloaded the red, green, and blue of the right half of this image the red, green, and blue of the left half of this image and stuck them together to make a full scene panorama. I had to do that because that's just how the objects in here were, were, were captured by the rover. But you're looking at the inverted heat shield from the entry and descent and landing system of opportunity. Um, and it was like whatever happened during the landing here, it bent that heat shield uh, inside out. So that's why, it, you know, typically it would be the ablated side, the dark side from entering the atmosphere is inside here. So it almost yeah. looks like a kind of a, a funky tent that's been blown, you know, blown off of its uh, its attachments. But the inside of it would be all kind of charred and burnt and stuff like that. Yeah, there's springs in the foreground. And a spring and stuff. <laughs> I mean, this is, I, I love this image because it's because um, it's got just, you know, yeah, yeah, it's litter. 
you know, we yeah, live we're trash in Mars. Yeah. <laughs> but it's trash in Mars. But, th- but this is stuff we can relate to. You kind of know, you know, okay, yeah, that's a spring. And there's some, you know, little shiny bits. Those are nuts and bolts. This is stuff that was left from the landing of an alien spacecraft on Mars. But in this situation where the aliens, it came from Earth. That's very nice. Yeah, yeah. Actually, there's two alien objects in this image here. There's the, there's the, well, there's the trash and junk and the heat shield. And then just off to the uh, uh, upper left there, you see that there's, there's like a rock in the distance. That's that's a uh, that's an ast- I mean, asteroid. That's a meteorite. Right. So there's another landed object from outside of Mars in this image. There's a heat shield, and then there's heat shield rock, which was the first uh, the first astro- uh, I keep saying the first meteorite to be found on Mars by opportunity. That was really cool. Yeah, that is cool. That is very. I nice. want to say that might actually have been the first meteorite to to have been found on Mars. Very nice. And so this was just a couple of images and you just, uh, this is really, yeah, this is, this is six images right here that made this, right. you know, a, a three color composite for the left half and a three color composite for the right half. And then I stuck them together and, and tried to blend the seam as well as I could, uh, that runs down the middle in Photoshop. Okay. Well, I want I'm running out of time. I just want to show this one more of a, of a, uh, opportunity. Uh, is it a sunset? Is that what it is? Yeah, yeah. This is a um, so this is a, well, actually, it's a sunrise. Sunrise. This is okay. a this is yep. This is a sunrise on Mars that was captured by Opportunity on May six, two thousand and four. So this was Mission Sol one hundred and one. So it's just after it's just after the uh, the end of Opportunity's ninety day mission plan. Now here we are. It's you know five thousand some odd days, but but you know this is this is Sol one hundred and one, and Opportunity captures this beautiful sunrise, and because the this is this is basically a a true color vis- uh, uh, true color image of the sun and the bluish haze. Um, you know, there, there gets to be a little bit of a, uh, uh, a a blue effect on Mars at sunset and sunrise from dust in the atmosphere scattering uh, scattering light, the same way that you know air molecules in our atmosphere scatter light and create a blue a blue effect. Um, the only thing that's different that I had to fudge in this particular image was the sun had moved during the three frames that it was that the red green and blue were taken so i i took one of those made it the only one the only sun that you see so you don't see a you don't see a red sun a green sun and a blue sun kind of over overlaid each other down at the bottom there so and i i cleaned up the i cleaned up the rest in photoshop other than that this is this is the this is a sunrise on Mars. The, my two favorite things about this image is you can see the angular size of the sun uh, is much smaller than it would be here on Earth. Here on Earth, if you hold your thumb out at arm's length, uh, that's about the width of one of the solar disk. And here it's much smaller. And also just the, well, the fact that you were able to get the blue scattering uh, that causes the blue sky here on Earth, uh, on Mars, it just takes so much more of the atmosphere to get that scattering. Uh, that's incredible. And of course, the general orange color of the sky. It's just, you know, beautiful picture. Really nice. I want to, I want to end that with, with, with this and, uh, with that picture and we are out of time folks. Is there any last minute questions, guys? I was looking at, I didn't, I saw a lot of comments, but I didn't see many questions. So, uh, is there any, do you guys see anything? Guys? There's nothing on this good. Okay. But I just like to say that, um, I've got, I've got a piece of Mars. There it is. Because in the center of the circle. Hang on just a second, John. What is, what is it? A little, little um, fragment from the Mars meteorite. How'd you get that? What's it? Oh, that's really cool. Neat. So that's a, so that's a meteorite? Is that what Oh, it's, it would have to be, yeah, because we haven't had any sample return emissions yet. Yeah. So, yeah. If you just hold it to the light properly, you see it better there. Oh, yeah, I see it's it. Like a little, um, little dot in the center. Oh, that's really cool, John. That's really neat. Crazy. Well, authentic, apparently. <laughs> All right, that's awesome. It's not a piece of gravel from the bottom of the sea. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. Well, that is it for this Telescope Talk. I want to thank our guest, Jason Major, for taking time out to talk to us about how to go about getting these images from other uh, missions, Opportunity, uh, uh, Cassini, uh, Voyager even. Uh, these are things you can do as an amateur astronomer. Uh, Jason, you uh, were careful to point out that you were not like an observational astronomer guy, that you just do this for fun, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can take my small telescope out and look at, you know, look at Saturn or Jupiter or Mars or something like that. But beyond that, um, I, I just I just don't know my way around the night sky very well. 
Um, and I'm not a, I'm not a telescope, I'm not a telescope gearhead. Um, you know, some people just, that's, they live for that type of thing. I don't know yes, too much about do. it. I'm trying to learn. I really am, but it's just, it's, it's, it's another realm entirely. So no, I, I focus on this stuff, which, which shows us, you know, closer connections to, uh, other worlds by, you know, rovers, robots on them or around them. That's, that's really what amazes right. me. Right. And what's important about this topic, guys, is that this is an area of amateur astronomy that didn't really exist prior to the high speed you know, internet connections that we have today. Right. And it's only been recently with the advent of things like virtual observatories and with NASA missions putting their data on online archives that this has become possible. Now, I've mentioned before, there has been sort of a tradition with the SOHO spacecraft, which, believe it or not, has been up longer or as long as Hubble, where they have their last go C2, C1, C2, and C3 coronagraphs. People have been using those. And it's been up against, you know, like I said, 26, 7 years or 20... Yeah, about 27 years, 28 years now, uh, where it has been looking at the sun and these sun grazing comets have been flying by. And people have actually, amateurs have actually discovered comets using C3 data. So it's been going on for a while, but that was kind of the birth of this whole thing where you could use NASA uh, and ESA instrumentation to get your own images and process them yourself. People would make movies of the solar corona and all kinds of stuff. But it's really come into the mainstream now. This is something you can do. We haven't even gotten into the citizen science aspect of this yet, but this, you know, just getting the data yourself, looking at it, proving to yourself what these features are, is something that all of us can do now, uh, thanks to NASA, ESA, and uh, other, other, and ESO is another big uh, ground-based observatory place you can get data from. So I encourage you to give this a try. Uh, the two sites we've talked about here were Opus and, what was the other one, MER, what was that? Uh, Mars, uh, the the MER site, the yeah, Mars Exploration the, Rover Mars site, Exploration and, and Rover Curiosity site. as well. Right, and JPL, go on there and check out those things. Play with the data; it's, it costs you nothing but a computer and maybe I don't know some kind of image processing program. Jason was saying Photoshop works best, and it does. Uh, but you know, if you need to get GIMP or something similar, that's free just to learn to see if you like it, and then maybe purchase the Photoshop. You don't need a telescope; you don't need to spend thousands of dollars. Alex is. You know, he's not here today, but probably for the best, because I can tell you now, I would rather look at NASA data than maybe take my own through my own telescope. It's just cheaper. <laughs> so this is a good thing you can do as an amateur astronomer. Well, thank you, Jason, so much. I hope maybe you'll come back another time. We can talk about uh, some of the other aspects, maybe some of the citizen science things that are out there. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I know. And, you know, sometimes that's not much, but <laughs> I'll, well, I'll, I'll share it. Well, it's been a real pleasure having you on our hangout. Thanks for taking time. Thanks, out. Tony. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Okay, folks. Well, I could, go ahead, Adam. I was just going to say I could happily stay for another hour, two hours and listen <laughs> to Jason images and how he makes them. It's been great. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, we will be back in two weeks where we will be talking I think about observatories, but we haven't, we haven't uh, home built observatories, but we haven't settled on that topic yet. Uh, we also next Wednesday on the off Wednesdays, now that I'm not doing the Exo Life Hangouts anymore, I will do a live star talk on Wednesday, uh, the off Wednesdays when we don't do, uh, when we don't do telescope talks. So that'll be here. Same time, same, uh, same, uh, same channel. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks everybody for watching. And as always keep looking up. And don't trip over your telescope. <laughs> <laughs>